back there in Jesus' time, the Pharisees walked so proud. They thought that they had the way to God. They prayed their prayers out loud. Jesus said they had hell to pay for their pretense and the games they played. I'm glad it's not like that today. We wouldn't act like that. No. Everybody else but me. Everybody else but me. He was talking to the hypocrite and Pharisee. Everybody else but me. I went to church one day last month. The preacher preached real good. He talked about true commitment and New Testament brotherhood. He talked about watching the things we say, gossip that can wound and slay. I sure wish Joe had been there that day, because he really needed to hear it. You know? Everybody else but me. Everybody else but me. He was talking to the hypocrite and Pharisee. Everybody else but me. When Jesus made disciples, told them what they had to do. Turned their backs on everything except what he called them to. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself and you'll be free. But he met those guys back in Galilee. That was just for them back then, you see. Everybody else but me. Everybody else but me. He was talking to the hypocrite and Pharisee. Everybody else but me. Everybody else but me. Everybody else but me. He was talking to those people back in Galilee. Everybody else, everybody else, everybody else but me. Everybody else but me? No, no, no. Maybe you guys. Thank you, Ty. Wow. Okay. That might be a little too much. So little words can make a big difference. Little words like the. The makes a big difference. Remember the story of uh, King Arthur. King Arthur was a squire or servant to a knight, and the knight lost his sword. And he said, King, he said, Arthur, not a king yet. He said, Arthur, go get me a sword. And Arthur was running back to get a sword, and he found a sword sticking in a stone. And he pulled the sword out, and he brought it to his master, and he said, here's a sword. And the answer came back, it is not a sword, it is the sword. Well, I was studying our text for this week, and I don't know, I'm not in the monitors, am I? No? I'm wondering, can you turn that one off, see if that's part of it? So I'm... I'm, uh, I'm looking at our text for this week, and it's really interesting. I want you to look at it with me in your Bibles. It's Acts 2, verse 42. 242. 242 is a really interesting text because it's not translated correctly, so I made my own translation. Let's look at 242. We had it on the, uh, the screen earlier, but the, the 242 that we read in the New King James, for instance, says... And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And that's kind of close. But what's really interesting about this text, after you get past the verb, the verb is that they attentively focused. So we look at attentively focused and what does that mean? It means something more volitionally than they came to a place and met together. They intently focused. They marshaled their attention. They marshaled their skills and their strengths. And they focused 
on the following things. And each of the four following things is articular in Greek. That means it has the word the before it. So they attentively focused on the teaching of the apostles. Now, your Bible probably says the apostles' teaching, and the words in Greek are in that order. They're apostles' the teaching. The problem is in English, we don't ever say apostles' the teaching. We have to move it around to get the the on there. So it's the apostles' teaching. And you know, I've been thinking, what is it that they studied back then? Because they didn't have the New Testament. They only had the Old Testament, and get this, they didn't have the Old Testament in their hands. They had to go look at the Old Testament at the synagogue. They couldn't just open it up at home. They didn't have the Bible. It was very expensive, and they were kept in velvet bags. And so they would have to go to the synagogue and look at it. Now, I'm going to tell you their brains were better than ours because they memorized these things. And we should be memorizing, too. There was an interesting study done recently, actually very recently, in the last couple of years, a really interesting study done on memory and retention and how people learn not just the material, but learn the meanings of the material and have it internalized. And here's how they did the study. They took four groups, and the first group, they allowed them to read the material, read the section as long as they wanted, as many times as they wanted in five minutes. The second section they took, and they allowed them to read the material in several shorter bursts, two or three minutes, and they let them read it two or three different times to see how they could cement it in their memory. And the third group, they asked them to diagram it. So they gave them paper and pen, and they asked them to read it and, and make a logical chart or diagram of the ideas that were contained in it. And then the last group, they asked them to read it for five minutes as much as they could, and then they sat them down and asked them to write out as much as they could remember, and then they let them look at it another five minutes, and then they let them write it out again. They tested all these people after one week. And the people who were allowed to read it and try to write it down and read it again had over 50% better comprehension, not just of the material, but of the meaning of the material when tested on the meaning. Now you say, well, that was a kind of a silly study. And I'm going to tell you this, it isn't. The Bible memorized is our greatest source of Bible knowledge. The Old Testament writers memorized it. We should memorize it. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of programs out there that have texts set to music. And we can learn these texts. And when we learn the text, they become a part of us. There's a game out there. I don't know how many of you have ever played it. It's called Minecraft. Now, Minecraft is an interesting little artificial world. And in that world, everything is a three foot by three foot by three foot cube. But there are different kinds of cubes. If, if you're walking around, there might be cubes of dirt, and there might be cubes of stone, and there are trees that are, the trunks are made of cubes of wood. And you can manipulate these objects in that world. Now, in every world, there is a certain given percentage of neat stuff, like coal, for instance. So a certain percentage of all the cubes in the world are coal. A certain percentage of all the cubes in the world are iron ore, and you can use those materials to do different things, and a certain percentage of the things in the world are diamond. And so you get to go through and mine for them. And so you, you dig down into the earth, and the only way to find these things, because they're kind of randomly distributed throughout the world, the only way to find them is to dig long tunnels, just like a miner, and find things. And that's exactly how I see Bible study. I wasn't a very good student. I was okay, but I didn't really maybe invest as much in it as I should have. Sorry, teachers. I wasn't a very good student, but today... The greatest pleasure I find is in reading and studying the Bible. It is just like Minecraft. There is a certain percentage out there that is diamonds. And you dig down into it and you find these diamonds and they are life-changing. This text here, I was expecting to do all six texts that we listed in the bulletin this week. And I couldn't get past this one. Here it says that the early church was was marked by, was known by, was completely consumed by doing four things. Thing one is studying the teaching of the apostles. And the question is, are we studying 
we are so lucky. Not only do we have it here all in one book that every one of you can afford, and if you can't, I'll give you one. Anybody need one? You don't want to admit you can't afford it. I understand. But we all can have a Bible. In my house, we have dozens of Bibles. But not only that, it's free on the Internet. It's free. You can look at a Bible anywhere you want. You can download several for your phone. We have an unprecedented access, not only to the Bible, but to Bible study materials. You don't have to be a Greek expert. I'm not a Greek expert, but I made my own translation of this verse. You can make your own translation of this verse. All you have to do is go to the Blue Letter Bible. It's free. And you can start mining through there, and you can look at the original Greek. You can look at the original Hebrew, although it doesn't look like letters to me. But you can look at it, and you can learn exactly what the original intent was. Because translators have gone before you and done every word for you. And here it is. It says they were focused on the teaching of the apostles. And the next thing it says, it was focused on, most of your Bibles say fellowship. But let me tell you what the problem with that one is. There is a big difference between a sword and the sword for King Arthur, right? There is a big difference between they were focusing on fellowship and they were focusing on the fellowship. The word the is in there, and the word could be fellowship or it could be community, but they were focused on the community. Now, my mom grew up in a little bitty town called Delavan, Illinois. Delavan was just south of Pekin. You ever heard of Pekin? Pekin is just south of Peoria. You've heard of Peoria, right? But it was a really little town. I'll tell you how little a town it was. Her graduating class in high school was about 20-some people. And she subscribes to this day, at age 91, she subscribes to the Delavan newspaper. And when she reads that newspaper, she goes, Oh, that must be so-and-so's granddaughter. She still knows all those people in that little town. And she can read about them, and she'll tell us about them. Hey, you know that girl I told you I went to high school with? And we're going, you know, you're talking about something that happened in the 1930s. Right? And she, tell us, she tells us these things, and, and she knows all those people. Sometimes she even calls them on the phone. Community is something that we have lost. And it says that these people devoted themselves to the community. Not community, but the community. In our world, we're losing community. They say that the statistics show we dine in each other's homes far less than we ever have. We communicate, have fewer friends than we ever have had before. And as a result, we have higher rates of depression. And I used to think that the opposite of community would be isolation. You know, uh, who's the fellow that was out on the island? Robinson Crusoe. That's the opposite of community is Robinson Crusoe, right? But in fact, it's not. The opposite of, commu uh, opposite of community is isolation within a group. I don't know how many of you read, most of you probably did, read about Pia Farrakop this week. Did you all read about Pia Farrakop? She was the German lady in, in Pontiac, Michigan. And they found her body in the back seat of her car. And it was in the garage of her house. And she'd been dead in the back seat of her car in the garage of her house for between three and six years. When they interviewed her family, I mean her friends, her neighbors, I shouldn't call them friends, they said, well, we didn't know where she was. We haven't seen her for somewhere between three and six years. Some neighbors thought they saw her three years ago. Most of the neighbors didn't recall seeing her for the last six years. She had direct payment out of her bank account for her utilities and so her utilities continued to run and no one came to check on her she was dead for as long as six years and nobody knew now it's easy for us to say wow she should have been a part of a church church community right i mean we wouldn't let that happen here right i hope that's true but to our shame, let me tell you a story. A year after we came here, I got a telephone call. A man with a heavy accent of Filipino accent. And he called and he said, my son is in the hospital with leukemia. 
Will you come and see him? He's a member of your church. His name is Dennis Lagoska. I said, I don't know a Dennis Lagoska. I looked on the church rolls, and sure enough, there was a Dennis Lagoska. I asked several of the people in the church. I asked members, and I asked elders, and I said, nobody knew him. Nobody knew a Dennis Lagoska, so I went to the hospital, and it was a little bit anxious to know if I'm going to recognize this guy or not, you know. And I walk into the, into the hospital room. I know him well. I shake his hand every week. Every first service Sabbath morning, he would come in late to that back door over there, and he would sit right down there, and he would listen to the service, and he would walk out before the service was quite over and leave. And if I ever got up during the service, for any reason, I'd always shake his hand when I went back. But I never got his name. Time went on, and I kind of put it in the back of my mind. as here's, And we visited him more as he was, as he was fighting his illness. But uh, I put it in the back of my mind, the reason we didn't know this guy is because, you know, he's a loner. He's an isolationist. You know, he didn't get to know us, so we didn't get to know him. And I, I kind of tried to make myself feel better about it. Until his funeral. The family invited me to come help them with the funeral arrangements. And they had picked a terrible little funeral home. And, and they had just one little bitty room that seated maybe 35 people on a good day. And they said, will this room be big enough for the funeral? And I thought, it'll be too big. Until his friends all started arriving and there was no place to sit. It turned out that Dennis had worked at a company down in Plano selling, uh, he was the warehouseman, and they sold artificial plants like the ones you see up here. And he was their warehouseman. And the company shut, it, shut the whole company down for the day for the funeral because that's how important he was to their business. Apparently, the whole time he was in the hospital, they were on the phone every day saying, where is such and such, where is so and so? And he was un unreplaceable in the business. And then a whole group of Filipino young men showed up. And I said, who are these people? And they told me that they were his dinner club. That Dennis was a great chef and he used to barbecue goats and make a whole meal to go with them. And he fed these guys on a regular basis. And we never knew him. He sat right back there, and we never knew him. And my question to you is, do you know who's sitting around you today? Do you know who you haven't got to know in this church? Do you know what you're missing? Do you have any idea what you're missing here? It says that the early church consistently and intensely devoted themselves to the community. What does that mean? That means they went from house to house, and they got to know each other. This morning in this church, did you know that there's a former nun sitting in this room? This morning we had a taxidermist sitting in this room. We have people who have been in the military and served honorably in the military. We have... Uh, other kinds of heroes, quiet heroes. We have wonderful chefs sitting here. We have people who left their home countries and their families with what they could carry and no expectation that they'd ever see their families again. We have people who have done great things. And we have people who have done small things and there are people in this room that still have great things yet to do. And I'm shamed that we don't know you well enough. There are all kinds of people that God has called us to be one with, in unity with. And I call you today to follow the example of the early church and to devote yourself to the community, this community. The next thing it says they did is they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. Now, a lot of theologians have studied this and tried to decide whether this means the communion meal or it means more than the communion meal. It turns out in the New Testament, and there's a study to be done here and we need to do it, and the study in the New Testament is, what does the communion meal and what does this other phrase that crops up in the New Testament, the love feast, mean? 
What does the love feast mean? By the way, this church also has five or six retired pastors. Did you know that? And in this church, probably one of you has already done this study. Maybe you could just share it with me. We have an agape feast or a love feast every year at this church. But I just thought it was a good idea when we started it. I had no idea that there's a whole New Testament theology built around it. There is a love feast in the New Testament. Don't you think it'd be important for us to know about that? We ought to be studying about that. This love feast apparently is a place where everybody comes and shares food from house to house in everybody's meal. But in 21st century America, we don't want anybody coming to our house. We build bigger and bigger and more and more beautiful houses, but boy, we don't want you coming to them. Our last evangelist who came here said that he had found it counterproductive to do visitation. Whenever he showed up at a house, it was the last time he saw him at the meeting. People in North America do not want you in their houses. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed they all say, hey, you want to get together? Sure, I'll meet you over at Chili's. No, no, I mean together. No, no, I'll meet you over at Chili's. Can we not come to your... No, meet you at Chili's. We are a people who are intimacy phobic. And that is not the model of the New Testament church. Should it not be our goal to reproduce the New Testament church in this community right here? We are not a church. We are the church. We are not sitting in a church. We are the church. Any two of us is the church. Any one of us is a believer. Any two of us is a church. Can we have church at home? You bet we can. How many of you have done it this week? That's the question. How many of you have met with another believer in your home, besides your spouse or children, this week? This Church is to be congratulated because we have a lot of Bible study going on in this church, right? Norma has one in just a few minutes here. We're making her late right now. Yeah, okay. We have one in the afternoon. We have one on Wednesday afternoon. We have Bible studies all the time in this church. This church is full of Bible studies. So that's good. That's good. But we also need a place where we can become intimate with one another where we can learn about one another, where we can understand one another's needs, desires, and wants, because it says we are to become unified, we are to become one, and we cannot do that each from our own houses. We need to get together. So the third thing it says is breaking the bread. So are we breaking bread together? Are we sharing meals together? You know, potlucks were invented in the Bible. It says they went from house to house. Preparing food and eating together. And the last one it says is the prayers, which is really an interesting concept. The prayers. There are prayers that we pray alone and in solitude. And there are prayers that we pray in public, right? Now, I think that the world is going a little crazy in terms of making everything that should be private public and everything that should be public private. And one of the things that should be more public is prayer. Everybody knows I'm a fan of Dan Cerns. And so the first time I called Dan Cerns and asked for some advice, I'm talking to him on the phone, and after he's done giving me the good advice, and it's always good advice whenever you call Dan, at the end of the phone call, he says, okay, before I let you go, let's pray together. I'm thinking, on the phone, we're both driving in different parts of the city, really? We want to pray right now? And I thought, should I close my eyes? And <laughs> So I closed one eye. <laughs> and he prays for me on the phone. It was very awkward. I hated it. Just hated it. But every time I call him for advice, I have to go through that, and I've gotten really comfortable with it. And it's actually a very sweet thing to be able to pray with somebody over the phone. It's really a sweet thing, and I want to encourage you to try it. Now, if you call me, maybe I'll do it to you. You see how I said do it to you? At first, I'm doing it to you. Later, we'll do it with you, okay? Little words make a difference, don't they? I'll do it to you. I'll pray to you on the phone. I'll pray on you on the phone. And then later, we can pray together on the phone. Praying on the phone is a good way to pray together in this busy world. 
I think we ought to try it. I think we ought to try praying impromptu. You know, people often come up to you and they say, man, I've got this problem or I've got that problem or I've got the other problem. I'm growing the courage with the Holy Spirit to say, well, let's pray about your problem. When people tell you about a problem, sometimes they're asking you for a solution. Man, I don't know how to get this screw to hold in this hole, right? That's asking for a solution, isn't it? The other kind of solution, problem they tell you about is, I just don't know how to get along with my spouse. Now, they're not asking for a solution there. They don't expect you to know the solution. Even though you might know the solution, you best not just give it to them right there in public. When they say something like that, why not say, you know, I'd really like to pray about that. Could I pray with you about it? Take them off someplace private and pray with them about it. We should be praying together. We should be spending time together. What is it that we are doing that is making, that is so important that it's keeping us apart? Oh, you say, I don't have time. I don't have time to go over there and study. Well, let me tell you something. We live in a dangerous world. I don't know if you knew this, but I have some statistics here. Did you know that automobiles cause 20% of all fatal accidents in this country? Automobiles are very, very dangerous. 17% of all accidents occur in the home. Your home is very dangerous, much more dangerous than you think. Walking on streets and sidewalk causes 14% of all accidents. Accidents. Pedestrian accidents. Avoid traveling by air, rail, or water because 16% of all accidents involve those forms of transportation. Of the remaining 33%, 32% of all deaths occur in hospitals. Hospitals are very dangerous places. You should avoid hospitals. <laughs> People die there all the time. Only one thousandth of one percent of deaths caused during worship services. <laughs> I think you can read the cards on that one, can't you? Even less dangerous is Bible study. So uh, I think you know where we're headed with that. I would like to talk to you just in closing about the small groups that are and the small groups that are to be. Women's ministry is having, a, having an event next week next weekend and it's an event where there's going to be singing and there's going to be other things and I think you're going to have an opportunity to share around the bonfire to visit to talk to meet people to figure out who it is that you're actually supposed to be joined as a part of a family to there are other opportunities you know people have these amazing stories and we don't know them we just don't know them you know, the, the, we, we announced this concert on the 22nd. Do you, do you, anybody remember the 22nd concert? Dan Holder is his name. Do you all know Dan's story? How many of you know Dan's story? So Dan was, a, Dan was a singer in some singing groups with Buzz many, many years ago. And, uh, and he, after that, had a duo that they did together called, called Tranquility. We used to play their, their tapes all the time, their CDs. We didn't have CDs in those days. We actually played vinyl records. But anyway, we played the vinyl records on the radio station in those days. Well, Dan got together, and he decided to make a solo album, and he went over to London to get a really great orchestra to do his backgrounds for him. And he had all those backgrounds recorded, and he brought them back to his recording studio in California, and he was ready to make his recording, and he started laying down tracks, and the recording company erased the tapes that he'd paid so much money for. Litigation ensued, and the company that lost the tapes took bankruptcy and left him with nothing. I don't know if Dan has attended church in these years, but I know he's been living in Alito as an information technology person for the last 20 or so years, and I've gone to every church over on that side of Fort Worth, and I've never seen him. I don't know if he's been attending. I do know that he went into work outside music. And after all this time, it turns out that Dan's been writing songs quietly at his house, day after day, week after week, 
Buzz tells me he has about 400 songs that he's written. 500 songs that he's written. No one's ever heard any of them. So he comes one day a week all the way from Alito to Buzz's garage to record these songs down. He's got one album out now, and he's working on a second one. And that's a story I want to participate in. That's a person I want to get to know. That's a person I want to engage with. And he's going to be here in two Saturday nights, and he's going to let us hear some of those songs that nobody but he and his mixing people have heard that have come out of 25 years of solitude. But I tell you that story not because I think that he's a very special person. He is. But I think every person in this room is a very special person. We've got missionaries from Guam, was it? Marshall Islands. We've got, we've got people who have come here from other countries. We have a treasure trove. You know, we talked about mining in the Bible for truth and being overwhelmed by the truth we find. When we mine into the people sitting around us, we'll be overwhelmed by the beauty that God has brought into our family. And so I'm going to ask you this week, I'm going to ask you to do two things. You know, I always ask you to do something, right? So I'm going to ask you to do two things, and I don't care what, what translation you use. But I want you to memorize Acts 2.24. Here's my translation. They kept attentively focused on the teaching of the apostles and the community and the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Okay? I want you to memorize that. And then I want you to work on your schedule and your calendar with me. I'll work on mine too. So that every week I have a place put in for studying the teaching for attending to the community, for breaking the bread in community, and for prayers. Would you commit with me this week to begin a habit and a practice that we do all four of those things in the community of the church of which we are a part? Will you join me in that? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us to approach you and to approach your church. We thank you that you have given us the privilege of being the church. And as we accept the mantle of becoming the church together, we ask especially that you will give us the courage to pray with one another, to share meals with one another, to experience community and intimacy with one another, and to study with one another. We know that this is your will, and we know that you'll empower us to do it if we'll only step into the water and move forward towards you. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.